Let's pray. God, we're thankful for your word, and as we um, look today at the crucifixion of Christ, we pray that you would uh, guard our hearts from distraction, guard our hearts from uh, thinking ahead, guard our hearts from uh, being numb to the common nature of this passage. So, Lord, please work in our hearts. Uh, use me as your instrument to communicate truth. In your son's name, amen. You know, the, in seminary, one of the challenges our professors pointed out was that preaching common texts, texts that most people are familiar with, is one of the most challenging things. Because, because there's always a temptation to want to pull a rabbit out of a hat. To say, wow, I never heard that thing about the crucifixion or about this common text. But the reality is, the texts that we're most familiar with are the texts that we're most familiar with for a reason. That the entirety of the book of Matthew has been building to this point. The entirety of the Bible has been building to the point of the text that we're looking at today. The entirety of human history has built to this point. And so it makes sense that this is a common story in our creed. This is a common story in our experience. That we talk about the crucifixion because it's the central act in our salvation. And so as we look at this text today, we ask the question that Paul's talking about in Romans 1-3 to is, how can a God maintain His righteousness and be merciful to those who've rebelled against Him? You've heard the, the courtroom analogy that a judge that would let guilty people go, we wouldn't pat him on the back for being a merciful judge. We would be in anger because he, he didn't do his job. He didn't execute justice. And yet when it comes to our own sin, we want just that. All the world's religions basically boil down to the idea of try to be a good person. That if your good outweighs your bad, then you're all right. But not so with Christianity. How does a righteous and holy God maintain His righteousness, and yet extend mercy to us. And that's the subject of our text today. So if you have your Bible, open to Matthew chapter 27. As we look at the crucifixion of Christ and His atonement for our sin. Sin was that God created the heavens and the earth, and He told Adam and Eve, and He told Adam, don't eat of it. You can have any tree in the garden, just don't eat of this one tree. Because in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And so Adam and Eve sinned, and death entered into the world. And as we've walked through the Old Testament, we've seen God make a covenant. He called Abraham, and He made a covenant with Abraham, and He promised a seed that would deliver the people. That, that throughout the Old Testament He gives the law as a demonstration of the wickedness of man and a demonstration of the holiness of God. But man couldn't keep the law. And so it's with that backdrop that we come to the New Testament. All of prophecy has been looking forward to this moment. And throughout this text, we're going to see prophecy sprinkled in. Matthew's, Matthew's operation has been to show Jesus as the fulfillment of the expectation of of the Old Testament. Now crucifixion uh, is unsurpassed in its cruelty. Uh, it was intended to humiliate. It was intended to degrade. Crucifixion goes back to the Persians and other groups in the ancient Near East. The, the idea is that the bodies of those that were killed, the victims of, of crucifixion, for whatever crime they had committed or opposition uh, they were there for, that their bodies were displayed, it began on spikes, that there was a humiliation, a public humiliation, that these people deserved this gruesome death. But the Romans advanced the design to make it even more gruesome. The, the, the crucifixion of the Romans was, was a slower crucifixion. 
That basically the, the crucifixion of the Romans was about suffocation. That, that, that the victim was put on the cross uh, and, and his weight slowly cut off the blood supply so that he would have to lift to even get a breath. And slowly over time, uh, limbs would go out because there was no circulation, there was no oxygen. And so it was a slow, agonizing, gruesome suffocation that took place. But a quicker death, uh, because of Jesus' crucifixion, uh, he had to be killed before sundown because of the Passover, because of the Sabbath. Uh, nails were introduced to hasten the death. So that not just suffocation, but ultimately bleeding out. And so just imagine the most violent death possible, the most shameful death possible, the most humiliating death possible. Roman citizens were only able to be crucified by an actual edict from Caesar. This is a scornful death. And that's why the author of Hebrews tells us that Jesus in Romans 12 endured the cross, scorning its shame. Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So the issue with crucifixion isn't just physical pain. It's physical pain, humiliation, shame, suffering, all of that. And so it's with that backdrop uh, that, we, that we begin in the text. Now, Matthew and Mark tell their crucifixion story really with a, with a, with a more intense, they capture the horror of the scene. That in Matthew and Mark's account, you get a lot more of a picture of just how bad this thing was. But it's always contrasted with Jesus being in absolute control of the situation at all, at all, at all moments. Luke captures a lot more of Jesus' interaction with the people as he goes through the process. People who will worship him ultimately. And then John is going to emphasize in the crucifixion Jesus' total control of the situation. Let's look at verse 32. And they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry Jesus' cross. It was usual for the one being crucified to carry the cross beam uh, to the crucifixion place. Most likely the vertical beams were fixed so that you would carry the cross beam that would be attached. But because of the bloodshed, in the scourging that we read about last week, Jesus is too weak to carry His own cross. So Simon, the Cyrene, is, is asked to carry the cross. And R.T. France says, there was a need for Simon to take the place of the Simon who had so loudly professed his loyalty. There's an irony in the text. Where's Peter? And then they came a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. We don't know exactly why it's called the place of the skull. Uh, probably because uh, it visually represented a skull. Part, probably, possibly because it's where so many are executed. That there, there are two traditional options for where this place was. Uh, most likely it's, it's at the location of the church of the Holy Sepulchre. We have good traditional backing to that. But which in that church was outside the wall in the first century. But the idea is that this crucifixion is going to take place on a major thoroughfare. And as Passover week, so many are coming in and out of the city, it's, it's designed for ultimate humiliation. It says they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. The wine to drink mixed with gall. Gall is, is a bitter substance and basically it's, it's like a pain medication or, or, or a mild narcotic and, and it's intended to lessen the pain. They're trying to ease his suffering but he wants to communicate clearly he wouldn't drink it because he is in control of this situation. He's willing to endure this suffering to the fullest. Jesus makes clear that he is not a victim of what's taking place. All of us would be sitting beside looking at this man thinking that he's a victim. Jesus is very clear. I am in absolute control of this situation. He's fully aware and he's fully in control of what's taking place. 
And then verse 35, and, then they, and when they crucified him, they divided his garments by casting lots. They nailed him to a cross. Sometimes the victims would have just been hung, but, but for a quick death like this, they nailed him to the cross, and then they cast lots for his clothing. His garments are stripped. The soldiers are going to throw dice to see who gets them. This is fulfilling Psalm 22. We're going to see Psalm 22 in and out of this text all throughout. Matthew is clearly making reference and Jesus is highlighting Psalm 22, which is a psalm of David calling out against the, the, his enemies in a difficult time. If you go just read Psalm 22, you don't necessarily read it as a messianic psalm until you come to Matthew 27 and you see Matthew pull it in over and over. Matt, psalm 22, 18 says, They divide my garments among them, and for clothing they cast lots. That It points to the shame and humiliation that's taking place during the crucifixion. Then they sat and kept watch over him. These guards are vigilant. Over his head, they put a charge which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Most likely, Pilate wrote this as a mockery. And it's ironic that it stated the truth. That Jesus is the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him. One on the left, one on the right. Again, like Barabbas, the, the word they use for robber is actually, it's more the idea of an insurrectionist. It's someone who's taken up arms and rebelled. Isaiah 53, he was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many. That, that he's, again, if you're a passerby, Jesus is a transgressor. But as we look at the text, we know that He is actually paying for our transgressions. It's also ironic, one commentator pointed out, that the left and the right side where these two robbers are, these two criminals are, is exactly where James and John wanted to be. But there's no glory in these positions now. That we bear His Shame and suffering in our proclamation of Him as Lord. Verse 39, we have three sets of people described as mocking Jesus. Those who were passed by derided Him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you're the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Those that are passing through the main thoroughfare, wagging their heads, mockery, uh, ridicule. They're hurling abuse. And, and ironically, Jesus was accused by the religious leaders of blasphemy. These people are actually <laughs> blaspheming. This is the Son of God. Chapter 26, Jesus said his body would be destroyed in three days, raised from the dead. Uh, and they say, if you are the Son of God. It's the exact same language Satan used back in chapter 4. If you're the Son of God, do this thing. And these people come by and say, if you're the Son of God, Blumberg says, come down from that cross is the last great temptation for Christ. That the language tied back to Matthew 4 is clear. Come down from the cross. But to come down from that cross, had he given in to that last temptation scene, he would have forfeited his divinely ordained role. That it was necessary. He's in control of what's taking place. So also the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, this is the Sanhedrin, they mocked him saying, he saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and then we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For, for he said, I am the son of God. That even with the Passover going on, these chief priests and scribes, this would have been a really busy week for them. They would have had other places to be. The last place they would have been is out by a crucifixion outside the city on the side of the road. And yet they are, they are there making sure that their plans are carried out. 
They say he saved others talking about his healings. But he can't save himself. That he can't rescue himself. He can't deliver himself. But you and I know that he's not interested in saving himself. He's interested in saving us. He's the king of Israel. This is the covenant term for the nation. The Messiah will fulfill God's covenant with Israel. He actually is fulfilling that covenant right here, right there. Jesus' enemies mockingly promise a conversion. If you bring yourself down, then we'll believe in you. While Matthew expects his readers to capture the supreme irony. Since Jesus will do more than come down, He will come down and He will go up from the cross. Every reader should believe in Him. You know, in the next chapter, we're going to look at the resurrection. And we believe. Psalm 22.8 David's enemies are mocking him. He says, he trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. For he delights in him. That the mockery for David is, hey, if you're a follower of God, let God take care of you. And that's basically what the chief priests are saying, the Sanhedrin are saying here. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now Luke 23 lets us know that one of the robbers actually acknowledged Jesus and Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. But everyone in this scene, from the, the passers-by, the Sanhedrin, and now the robbers are actually mocking Jesus. Verse 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. This is noon to 3 p.m. Uh, and, and, the, and the darkness, this isn't a natural phenomenon. This isn't a, a solar eclipse. This is God's supernatural intervention shutting down the sun as He did in the ninth plague in Egypt. And it's a sign of judgment on the people. It says, the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a direct quote of Psalm 22. And so some will say that this is a, a cry of faith because as we look at the structure of Psalm 122, that, that, that it begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it ends in a hope. It ends with, with an acknowledgement that God's in control of this situation. And so there may be a sense in which Jesus says this and Matthew records this. They want you to think through Psalm 21 and recognize that there is hope even through this difficulty, even through this suffering. But at this point in the text, Jesus has been abandoned by His disciples He's been abandoned by Peter. He's been condemned by the Jews. He's been condemned by his own people. He's been taunted by his enemies. He's been taunted by the Jews, by the Jewish leadership. And now he's been forsaken by the Father. And this isn't a separation within the Trinity. But this is enduring the wrath for our sin. That the world is dark and Jesus suffers on a cross and it's not just the physical suffering the physical suffering is more than we can bear but the physical suffering itself is a temporary thing God Jesus is actually enduring the wrath of God for all of those who would repent and believe for all of our sin and and as we sat in this text as I was processing through my, this text this week, I tend to make such light of my sin. I tend to excuse myself. I tend to make justification for my wrongdoing. I tend to think it's not that big of a deal. But it is. And as we read through this crucifixion, we should be struck when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The endurance of that shame, the endurance 
of the wrath of God, of, of, the, of the, the bearing of our sins, this should never become old and cold to us. This is something we put in front of our minds all the time. He became a sin offering. God turns away from him. And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. Apparently, Eli, Eli, they thought he was calling for Elijah. Whether it's uh, just their folly. Uh, Elijah had gone away in a whirlwind. Many expected him to come deliver Israel in a time of need. And so the audience thought, maybe that's what Jesus is doing. He's just crying out in a desperate plea, Elijah, save me. And so... One of them ran and took a sponge. He filled it with sour wine. He put it on a reed and he gave it to him to drink. Some have taken this as a further act of mockery, but most likely this was an attempt at a kind gesture. They put it on a wooden stick. They raised it up for him. But others said, wait, wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. They, they continue to mock. Step back. Let's see if Elijah can intervene if God isn't going to. It says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded his spirit. He cried out again, this time at the fulfillment of God's will and his death in order to save us. Mark and Luke say he breathed his last. All of the acknowledgments that emphasize that Jesus has sovereignty over his own life. He wasn't killed so much as he yielded his life in obedience to the divine will, as one commentator put it. They didn't kill him. He laid down his life. This is a central event in human history. Just listen to the mockers. Jesus is the king of Jews, the king of Israel. You betcha. Jesus is the son of God. He is. Jesus is the only one we can place our faith because He did come down. Let Him come down and then we'll believe Him. As mentioned, the tone in Matthew and Mark are far more ominous. The torture, the pain, the marking, mocking is meant to fully demonstrate the depth of our depravity. We leave this text almost with a fear of coming judgment. If God takes sin this seriously... We now move on from the three groups of people that mock Jesus to three who will testify to who He is. We'll see nature testify to who Jesus is. We'll see uh, the soldiers testify who Jesus is. And then ultimately we'll see the women testify who Jesus is. He says, Behold, a curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook. And the rocks were split. Significance of the temple veil, which divided the most holy place from the holy place, being torn from the top to bottom, shows that it's an act of God from the top to the bottom, not men. Uh, and, and now we have an image of a new access into the presence of God. Some see this as a pronouncement of judgment. The early church saw this as a, as a, as a pronouncement of judgment on the temple that would come in A.D. 70. But we have new access to God, which signifies the end of the Old Testament sacrificial system. R.T. France says access to God will no longer be through the old discredited cultic system, but through Jesus himself, and more specifically, through his death as the ransom for many. Hebrews 10, 19-22 puts it this way. He says, Therefore, brothers... Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an e evil conscience and our bodies was pure with pure water. The earth shook the rot, rocks split. And these are boulders. Again, God is supernaturally demonstrating to the world 
that Jesus has endured the judgment meant for us and that now we have access to him. The tombs were also open. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after the resurrection, they went into the holy place and appeared to many. That this demonstrates that Jesus' death has accomplished something. That the power of death has been broken. It's, it's sort of a first fruit. It's sort of a, it's a demonstration of God's, of Jesus' death over death. It's the inauguration of a new era of salvation. It's available to all. That we see this passage as a fulfillment of Ezekiel 37, 12, and 13. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. And Ezekiel, a return to Jerusalem after the exile, here it's used as a, as, a, as a picture of the resurrection from the dead. This is a mysterious text because we don't know exactly who was raised from the dead. We don't know how many were raised from the dead. The, the majority view is that they were re- actually resurrected, not simply resuscitated like Lazarus. But most likely, during the death, we have the opening of the tombs. So it says in verse 52, the tombs were opened. And then the second part, the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tomb. That that actually took place with the resurrection. We don't get the details because the details aren't the point. What's the point? The point is Jesus died and death is being defeated. That's the point. Significantly in Ezekiel 37, in Ezekiel's vision of the valley of dry bones, verse 7 in Ezekiel 37, behold an earthquake. Verse 12, I'm going to open your graves. And then 12 to 14, you shall know that I'm the Lord when I open your graves, raise you from your graves, O people, and I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land and then you will know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. Ezekiel 37 is the promise of the giving of the Spirit of God to fulfill the promises of the new covenant. So because of that, this section shows that Jesus' crucifixion paid the debt. He was the sacrifice that ratified the new covenant, just as He said He would. This is blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. When the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and they said, truly, this is the Son of God. The centurion sees all that's going on and he gets it. He makes it clear with his testimony. There were multiple witnesses. They experienced the power of God and recognized it for what it was, that all these supernatural things happening are a divine witness to to the truth of, of what, who Jesus was. They were filled with awe. This is the exact same phrase that's used to the disciples at the transfiguration. There were also many women there looking from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, the mothers of Zebedee. Women often accompanied Jesus, and the fact they're here represented in all four Gospels that demonstrates that these ladies were faithful to the end. Commentators almost universally point out that it's unusual for women who are usually on the outskirts in the ancient world. They're unable to be disciples of rabbis. So here we see Jesus went outside of tradition and welcomed the women to follow him. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. This is a segue between the crucifixion and the resurrection. It's a chance for us to let things set in. Jesus is truly dead. 
He didn't have the appearance of death. He's dead. He has to be buried. The Roman tradition would have been simply to put him in a mass grave. They would refuse to, or, or they would refuse to, to bury a crucified person. They just let him hang as a testimony. The body had to be buried by sundown, though, because of the Passover. And Joseph is a member of the Sanhedrin, but apparently has been a follower of Jesus. And so he takes him and he puts him in a grave. We're told that two of the women stayed demonstrating their vigilance. Charles Quarles says, Cicero said that the terror of the cross was so horrific the citizens of Rome did not want the thought of the crucifixion to even enter their minds. They would clasp their hands over their eyes and ears rather than to see the victims writhing in agony or hear the screams of those suffering the excruciating pain of the cross. These women endured long hours of watching Jesus suffer, surely not because of any morbid curiosity. So he's saying things are so bad in a crucifixion that almost no one wants to be anywhere close to it. And these ladies stayed beside Jesus. Not because of their morbid curiosity, but because of their devotion to Jesus would not allow them to walk away. If Christ must suffer, they must remain with Him. Suffering with Him in their own way. The prominence of these faithful women in the account of Jesus' death contrasts with the shameful absence of the disciples. And it's a powerful warning against chauvinism in the community of Jesus' disciples. That they have endured this with Him. They've sat faithful with Him and they will bear a testimony of what Jesus did. And so we say this is the central point in human history, but, but what difference does it make when we talk about the atonement, Christ's atoning sacrifice on our behalf, what are we talking about? John Stott in The Cross of Christ does an excellent job. If you've you got to read one book on this, go grab it. But he, he really lays out the idea of atonement in a way that helps us understand what it is that took place when Jesus died on the cross. And he gives four terms that the Bible gives us to talk about Jesus' atoning sacrifice. The first is propitiation. Now, propitiation, a, that's, a, that's a big word. But the idea of propitiation is basically uh, that he, he took God's wrath for our sin. That God's anger towards sin, His wrath towards sin, was satisfied in the, in the person of Jesus Christ, in His death. Hebrews 2.17 says, Therefore, He had to be made like His brothers in every respect so that He might become a merciful and faithful high priest and the servants of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That Jesus endured the wrath of God towards sin. The righteous and holy wrath of God towards sin. It's not, when we think of anger, we think of flying off the handle, a, a dad being angry with his kids or someone just being beyond wit's end. God's wrath towards sin is a righteous anger. 1 John 2, 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. So the first thing that Jesus did on the cross was He bore God's wrath for sin. The second image we get in Scripture about atonement is redemption. That Christ purchased of sinners from the bondage of sin through the ransom payment of His death. That Jesus purchased our redemption he paid the price for our bondage. That we were bound to sin and Jesus paid our ransom. Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. Ephesians 1. In Him we have redemption 
through His blood. His blood was the payment required to purchase us. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Paul finishes. The third image is justification. This is God's judicial declaration of us as righteous. That, that we are righteous based on His righteousness. Jesus knew no sin. His lack of sin, His righteousness is imputed to us. And that's what justification is. Stott says when we're ready to understand the meaning of salvation, we begin negatively with redemption. That we are rescued by Jesus at the high price of His blood. Justification is the positive counterpart. Forgiveness remits our debts. Justification gives us righteous standing before God. That when we stand before God, we don't simply stand there as forgiven sinners. We actually stand before God as if we had never sinned. We stand before God declared righteous. That our righteousness comes from Christ and His perfect sacrifice. Romans 3, 23 and 24. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, who God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. And then the final term, propitiation, redemption, justification, and then finally reconciliation. That through the cross, Christ reconciled us to God. That He restored God's relationship with man. That this reconciliation is the most personal. Romans 5 says it this way, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. We exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation. That we were once far off from God, separated from God because of our sin. That Jesus' death brought us into complete reconciliation. That we can approach Him as our Father living in perfect fellowship with Him. And so Stott sums it all up and he says these are the four principal New Testament images of atonement. And they're taken from different places. That the propitiation comes from the shrine. Redemption comes from the market. Uh, justification comes from the law court. And reconciliation comes from the home. God doesn't just leave us with big theological terms but he actually explains this in a way that you and I can understand. And that's what the cross does. That Jesus endured our wrath. That Jesus paid the debt we owed. That Jesus brought us into a reconciled relationship with God. And that because of Jesus, we are made righteous. And he says each of these views teach us something different. First, they, they show us the aspect, a different aspect of our need. Propitiation underscores the wrath of God on us. Redemption, our captivity to sin. Justification, our guilt. And reconciliation, our enmity with God. These metaphors do not flatter us. They expose our need. Second, he says, they also demonstrate that the saving initiative was made by God. That God is the one who did all of this. He provided for our salvation. He who has propitiated his own wrath. He redeemed us from our miserable bondage. He declared us righteous in his sight. And he reconciled us to himself. And then finally, all four of these images plainly demonstrate that, that God's saving work was achieved through the bloodletting of Jesus Christ, the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. And since his blood is a symbol of his life laid down in a violent death, it's plain to each of the four images that he died in our place 
as our substitute. That we deserve every bit of the consequence that Jesus bore. The death of Jesus was the atoning sacrifice because of which God averted his wrath from us. The ransom price by which we have been redeemed. The condemnation of the innocent that the guilty might be justified in the sinless one being made sin for us. This is atonement. This is what Jesus achieved on the cross on our behalf. And so let us never approach this text casually, realizing that God, in His own initiative, sent His Son to pay for our sin. And that if we place our faith in Jesus Christ by simply saying, Jesus, I trust you. I trust that your death was sufficient for me. That's it. That's Christianity. We're not trying to earn these things. We're not trying to satisfy God's wrath by giving Him some good deeds that will cover it up. We're not trying to pronounce ourselves righteous because we're being good people. We're saying only in you, Christ. Only in you is God's wrath averted. Only in you is my price that I deserve to pay paid. Only in you am I declared righteousness. And only because of you am I reconciled to God. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for this text. And, and Lord, as, as we approach it, I pray for all of us that our hearts would be moved with a sense of gratitude. That, Lord, we would not approach you casually. That we would not approach the death of Christ casually. But, Lord, as worshipers who are so grateful that you paid the price for our sin, Jesus that you reconciled us, and that, Father, you desired for us to be reconciled. You desired for us not to uh, endure our own consequences if we have faith in you. Lord, would you work in our hearts, and if there are those today who don't know you, who haven't placed their faith in you, I pray that this text would singe their hearts that they might repent. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.